COVID-19 has disrupted the education for a whopping 1.5 billion students worldwide. Within just days, governments, faculties, universities, schools, children, teachers, parents were left to deal with the new and perplexing reality as the cities went into lockdown. Now seems to be like the perfect time to reflect on education. My today's guest is on a mission to make sure that digital training is accessible to as many people as possible. Joining me from California, the founder of Quasar Silicon Valley, Kwame Yamgnane. Kwame, good morning. Thank you for joining. How's the situation in California with the pandemic? So the situation in California with the pandemic is, uh, is kind of good. Roughly, uh, the peninsula is a very... Um, the barrier where you can find the Silicon Valley is a, is a, is a, we decide to go for uh, the lockdown like very early, like uh, early March. So everything is okay. That's great to hear. Um, Kwame, with the pandemic, you know, the EdTech really gained momentum. So the governments, uh, schools, universities, international organizations are really looking into investing into the EdTech because it really allowed millions of students to gain access to online learning during this pandemic. And for somebody as you who has been in the industry for decades, what is your take on what's going on uh, during this pandemic? You're completely right. It's a, it's a very good question. So the, the first part is like really to understand like education is a, is a very, um, uh, I, how, how to call that, like a very, very special, um, I would like to say market or way of thinking because uh, it's, a, it's something that has never changed so much uh, over the last 50 or 60 or even like 100 years. If you, if you really think about it, you still learn at school, you have a teacher, you have a classroom. So you have like short adjustment, but basically you have schools that have been built in the 60s where you still have the students inside and nothing has really changed. And on parallel of that, uh, the rest of the world has moved a lot. Why it tech exists? Because uh, some people that discover that like, the world is moving except education. Okay, you, you, and and a lot of people start to say to to government entities like you have to you have to take care of the situation because things are changing. Like. Um, Kids in the, in the, in the eighties are not the same kids that in the two thousand, and are not the same kids that in the in the in the two thousand twenties that we are right now. Um, thinking the world without uh, without mobile mobile device, for example, for education is completely crazy and a nonsense uh, because a mobile device is something that's going to be with you maybe for the next fifty or sixty years. So you have to know how to use it, how the usage of the of uh, of the internet, like what we call the digital literacy, that is like how to have the usage of the object of the internet, how to how to program, how to code it, and how to uh, what is the ethic behind all of that. So, so there have been a, a lot of pressure pushed on the government about that. But the problem is like no government has moved, and roughly what did happen with the pandemic? It has created like an evangelization of uh, 15 years in a couple of months. Because like suddenly, government said like, oh, we have to do something because like we are facing a huge issues. And the issue right now is like if, uh, if some governments are really slow um, about the ed, 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 ed tech, and the capacity to provide like online courses and remote courses and new, all these kind of new technologies because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you can bring your country to be late. Like the impact of that is like you can have like a whole generation that is not very well trained. And this will have an impact in maybe 20 years from now, because suddenly when you're going to try to find your elites, where you're going to try to rise your middle class, they don't have the education. And so they will not be able to live in the world of tomorrow. So uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's, a, it's really a big threat that, of course, is difficult to, um, to apprehend because you can't really see it straightforward. But in 20 years from now, this can have like a huge impact. Just as you said, you know, so during this pandemic, the uneven access to technologies, but also the Internet uh, in many parts of the world has actually shown, has disrupted education for many people that actually limited the access of the children to education. So there have been some hard learned lessons during this pandemic. Do you think uh, governments will start 
and universities and educators will start acting differently after this pandemic? I really think something's going to happen. Um, you, you're completely right. You had like uh, governments that are kind of prepared about yeah. what's going to happen. And I would like to say, like, uh, for example, Kazakhstan was kind of well prepared because like all the infrastructures in Kazakhstan is kind of good. OK, so you have like good Internet connection, good uh, Internet connection to Europe, to the US, all around the world. And roughly like uh, a, lot, a, a large amount of the population can get an access to the Internet. After you had like how to get access to a terminal, like it means like, okay, you get access to the internet, but uh, how, how your kids can get access to a school remotely? Because like, just for example, if you have like three kids or four kids and you have like only one computer, how, how, how are they going to go? To, how are they going to learn all together at the same time on those computers? So you have like the access of the basics, these kind of things can be, can be a big issue. So roughly, this accelerates a social gap between the, the, the people that are a lot of money and the people that don't have it. And like, if you're the, the question behind for a whole country is how to bring your whole population uh, to be like ready for the digital world tomorrow. And, um, and that's, that's a big question. And some countries are kind of well prepared. Yeah. Some countries are very well prepared, and some countries, unfortunately, are very badly prepared to, 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 to face this kind of situation. Well, Kwame, you're one of the people who are actually trying to bridge the gap, you know, and make high-quality digital training accessible to people. Through whatever projects you've done, this has been your mission for, you know, for years and years. And during this pandemic, you stepped up and you've actually launched an initiative here in Kazakhstan. Could you please tell us about it? We have started an initiative uh, with the AIFC, uh, its governor, and the BCPD. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's an initiative that we have launched in Kazakhstan uh, called like a Quant Dead KZ, uh, that uh, everybody can register and, uh, and start to learn how to code remotely using a uh, very advanced technology of teaching. Uh, all the students around the world are connected together. So some of your uh, Kazakh, actual Kazakh students are connected with our students here in the Bay Area, in the Silicon Valley. So it's, uh, it's uh, very amazing to see like uh, all the students working together. Oh, that's a fantastic initiative. Do you think if I registered, would I be able to take the training? Everybody with a lot of motivation can learn how to code. I think you have a, a, very, uh, a very strong agenda, so I'm not sure you have like, some time to spend to do that, but it will be our pleasure to have you with us on the platform. And that's wonderful. How many students are enro enrolled at the moment? So uh, it's uh, absolutely amazing what has been uh, done by the AFC and your government. Uh, I met like two times uh, your prime minister and uh, I can see a very strong motivation of your prime minister to push forward this kind of initiative in your country. So right now we have like about 400 students who are connected on the platform. We start the school um, mid-April. And uh, we're gonna jump. Uh, we have like uh, we're gonna have like I think like more 600 um, another 600 seats on the platform to rise to ramp up to a thousand students mm -hmm. learning how to code in Kazakhstan. So just to give you an idea, what does it mean? Okay, um, the largest computer programming school in Western Europe. Uh, has been launched in Paris, France, and he has started with a thousand students inside. France is a 60 million inhabitant country, and Kazakhstan is three times less. So roughly, it means like per habitant, what you have launched in Kazakhstan is three times bigger than what has been launched in Paris, which was the largest initiative launch, launched by a French billionaire, and I. So that's why I know it very well. Uh, so this is a school 42. So. In just a couple of months, your governments have done what uh, was necessary yeah. to uh, provide to more than a thousand students in Kazakhstan everything that is required to reach the best level of software engineers in the world, which means like the Silicon Valley level. Because what we do is like we want your population, your students who decide to become software engineers, to get the same level as a requirement that the most advanced, um, the most advanced uh, system in the world, which is the Silicon Valley, of course. Yeah.
That's really amazing to hear. We all know that the fourth industrial revolution is here and you know most companies will become technology companies as digital transformation continues. Uh, what are some of the future jobs and skills that we must be looking at now that will be in high demand in the digital world? So this is a, this is a very good question. Just to give you an idea, uh, we consider like, like last studies, we think like about 70% of the jobs that are fulfilled right now in 2020 were jobs that did not exist in the 2000s. Wow. So it would be for me uh, kind of difficult to, to, to tell you like what's going to happen in 2030, 2050, yeah. okay, from now, yeah. or what's going to be the next job. But what I can tell you is... Um, is of course we are preparing you for through that school we are preparing you uh, to, to to have job like straightforward out of the school that so there is no problem so we know like this job as software engineering what we call full stack developers full stack developers are the people that build like websites front end on back end uh, but basically like web uh, website we're gonna prepare you to be like data scientist and we have like an AI curriculum that we're gonna launch uh, a bit later where you're gonna teach the students how to use like machine learning and deep learning and most advanced like uh, artificial intelligence technologies so this is gonna give you like a lot of uh, set of skills for the next uh, couple of years but uh, beside that we offer you to uh, the way we have of teaching is really to give you a way of learning to learn how to learn. So uh, we give like digital skills that are useful inside the digital world. So roughly the idea is like when you have when you're going to finish quotes, uh, I can tell you like you should be able to be like very efficient in a digital world tomorrow. And roughly uh, we think that the world's going to be digital tomorrow. Well, you have a broad experience, you know, a very long experience too. You're one of the, you know, really pioneers in this sphere. You're starting with Ecole 42, then going to, into US 42. Uh, Born to Code is one of the, the other initiatives you've been involved in. And then you're also the founder of Quasar Silicon Valley. Um, what is Quasar? So as I said, okay, uh, education is a parallel world, okay, uh, like... Uh, a big prehistoric world. Okay, so uh, when you when you have to change uh, the habits of uh, of big dinosaurs, it's uh, it's it's very difficult. Okay, uh, so you have to you have to push. You have uh, you you uh, first is dangerous because sometimes they can they can trample you. You know, and uh, so 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 you have to. So we pushed uh, a lot over the last twenty years to create this kind of new schools, new way of teaching, new way of learning. Uh, you have to imagine what does it mean when you arrive and you explain to people that you're going to create a school without course, without teacher, without classroom, without time for curriculum, okay? People that just stare at you and say like, oh, you're, you're just crazy, okay? Uh, 20 years later, when you have like 25,000 alumni around the world, um, uh, very advanced alumni, you create like very, very, um, big uh, big tech companies in the Silicon Valley or around the world, you know, like people, they stare at you a different way, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And they say like, okay, so now you start to have results and you are able to change the things. But now Quasar, is the idea is to bring like all we did and to bring it to another level. Mm -hmm. Because now we are in the Silicon Valley, we are able to get access to the most incredible um, ecosystem in the world in terms of, in terms of innovation, and we we pick up like information from the Silicon Valley from our experience, and the idea is to mix all together to create something that is absolutely unique in the world, completely unique and even like more advanced or whatever we did before. So it's exactly what we have decided to do with, with Quasar. And secondly, the idea to, is to provide you a way of learning that is really affordable for everyone. Uh, you have to understand like when you learn uh, computer programming, computer science, we used to have like uh, requirements in terms of, for example, the computer to be used to enable you to be to to be efficient okay because like basically a, a software engineer is using a lot of power of a computer when he's coding doing things and you need like a certain a certain computer and those computers can cost up to 2000 
2500 uh, dollars uh, per user on who can afford to buy a 25000 computer to, to 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 just to learn how to code mm -hmm. so everything has changed now we are you are able to code in the browser we provide you everything to do it so you can start from any cheap terminal to learn how to code through uh, through the quant code school um in um in, uh, in Kazakhstan. So it's just to give you an idea, like everything, we, we have changed a lot of things. So it's, we, we change the access. It's way easier to get access to that, this kind of education. Uh, it's very cheap. Uh, it's way more efficient. You are connected in a network of students around the world. So you will be connected to students in Australia, in Nigeria, uh, uh, in Mexico, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Bay Area, in the Silicon Valley. So you're going you're gonna to participate to a huge network of students. So it's absolutely incredible. Well, you're changing the lives of thousands and thousands of your students from different parts of the world for better. So first, like today, I have uh, the opportunity that is amazing to discover like new culture, for example. So I never went in Kazakhstan before in my life. I, I didn't know nothing about Kazakhstan. I came to your country uh, three times now. Uh, I was like absolutely amazed uh, by how you are like welcome uh, to uh, foreign people like me who are like a bit lost in the middle of uh, Almaty or Astana, uh, do not speak the language, neither Russian, neither Kazakhs, and like always like amazing people around me. So uh, never receive uh, such a warm welcome around the world. Um, and secondly, I was like very amazed uh, by uh, by the by the energy of your country. Like, uh, we can really think, we can really see, like, something is happening in Kazakhstan. Even I'm going to tell you something, I was in Paris, and there was, like, a formal student uh, of a previous school that I did who came to see me and said, like, oh, do you have an idea? Oh, I want to go to Silicon Valley because I want to be successful, I want to do things. And I said to him, you know what? You should go to Kazakhstan. Because, like, right now, Silicon Valley is driven, like, by people who are, like, 60 or 70 years old. Uh, and I don't see really the future about that. But if you go in Kazakhstan, like, the country is, is driven by young people with an, a crazy hunger to succeed. I met, like, some of your startup. I saw, like, amazing things, like electronics, for example, that were, like, completely amazing. Your country has a huge tradition in STEM education. You have, like, Baikonur, uh, you have you are really really strong in uh, in STEM education. Your high school level uh, people in mathematics, physics is really good. So don't lose it. Continue this way, okay? Because it's very important. And now the step for you to step up to the next level is going to be finally kind of easy because you have all the infrastructures, like as I said, like internet high-speed internet connection, all this kind of stuff. So you just have to build on top. So what I have is, is uh, you, you are, I have the feeling to arrive in a country that is really emerging. Uh, you are leapfrogging a lot of things that has been done by uh, Western Europe countries, for example, and you're going you're gonna to be in the course like pretty soon. So uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a huge pleasure to work with you. So my only issue is to say, like, I don't understand why you have moved your capital to Astana. It's too cold. You should stay in Astana. <laughs> this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope okay. to see you in person next time. No problem. Thank you.